Well, grace and peace to you, beloved siblings, in the name of the lover and the reconciler of all things, Jesus Christ. And thank you so much to Port Nelson United Church for extending this invitation, and thank you for your living witness as the first uh, firm united church in the Halton region. It's such an honor to be with you on this Sunday for this celebration of pride and affirming ministry. Today I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and then verse 14. So let's listen together for the word of the Lord. Before time itself was measured, the voice was speaking. The voice was and is God. This celestial word remained ever present with the Creator. Their speech shaped the entire cosmos. Immersed in the practice of creating, all things that exist were birthed in them. Their breath filled all things with a living, breathing light, a light that thrives in the depths of darkness and blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot and it will not be quenched. That voice took on flesh and became human and chose to live alongside us. We have seen them enveloped in undeniable splendor, the one true Son of the Father, evidence in the perfect balance of grace and truth. And now may God bless us in the reading, in the hearing, and in the living of this sacred word. Well, believe it or not, folks, 23 years ago last month, I joined a church staff for the very first time I was only 19 years old back then, just finishing my first year of university, and I was so eager to become a part-time youth minister. I got a job and I held on to it until I graduated for a little more than three years. And looking back on those early days in ministry, I consider it providential that I ended up serving in one of the very few Baptist churches in Caldwell County, North Carolina, that actually had some inclusive, progressive leanings. And there was something about that inclusivity in that church that offered a sort of theological course correction for me, probably by just a couple of degrees. But it changed my vocational trajectory, and those few degrees were really all it took to set me on this course. I wouldn't be the person I am, theologically, socially, or in terms of my identity, if I hadn't ended up in that job at that church. Now, all of the relative openness of that church, according to the stories I was told, didn't exactly come about as the result of rigorous theological and political debate. As far as I know, no statements had needed drafting, no motions had required a mover and a seconder or a show of hands. It wasn't that kind of abstract issue. In fact, you might say it wasn't an issue at all, it was more like a story instead. It was a story about a little girl named Regina, whose parents had been bringing her to that Baptist church pretty much her entire life. Regina had been raised in faith there in that church. She had heard in that church about God's reconciling work in Jesus, about how the Holy Spirit that gave birth to the church at Pentecost was still active and still moving in the world. And you know, the Spirit moves where the Spirit will, And so it was, Regina began to sense that the Spirit was nudging her towards vocational ministry. Now the people of that Baptist church might have had some misgivings in those days about women in ministry. A lot of people do, unfortunately, but this wasn't some hypothetical woman. This was Regina. And they had watched her grow up. They had helped her uh, come to faith and taught her what it meant to follow Jesus. And so it was, when Regina decided to go away to seminary one day, the people of that church sent her with their blessing and their support. And they were proud when she became a chaplain one day. Regina changed things at that church through the power of her story, through the power of her testimony, her personal witness. Here I am. She said, I'm not some abstract issue. I'm not an idea. I am a person. I once heard the the trans activist and faith leader, Abby Stein, say, 
It's easy to hate an idea, but it's hard to hate a person. It's easy to hate an idea. It's easy to hate an issue. It's easy to hate something that is theoretical or hypothetical, but it's hard to hate a person with a personal story. It's hard to hate a face with human experience. It's hard to hate a pair of eyes that you got to look into when you decide to start drawing lines showing who's in and who's not. This time last year, I was anxiously preparing to deliver what, what turned out to be one of the most consequential personal stories I've ever shared. I was preparing to share a sermon about truth and about treasure, a sermon in which I would come out as a trans woman. I hadn't really accepted that I was trans until I was almost 40 years old. You know, my, my experiences and my understanding of gender up to that point had been marked by ignorance and by shame. And I had never really understood what it meant to be trans. That for every hundred or so times that someone holds up a newborn baby and says, it's a boy or it's a girl, there are a couple of instances where they're just going to be wrong about that. Now, I knew that I had been living a sort of depressive and dissociative life for, for many years, and I also knew that for a long time, I had been um, longing to live as myself, as, as a woman. Now, I got help as it was available to me, but, but in all those years, it never dawned on me that these two parts of my life, these two kind of sources of pain, might be interrelated. It never occurred to me that cisgender people, that is, folks who are not transgender, don't tend to find themselves lying awake at night thinking about how wonderful it would be if they could wake up the next morning as a different gender. Like many other matters of health and wholeness, we don't tend to notice unless something is off, you know? Well, there was something about my sense and my experience of gender that was definitely off in ways that many people just can't relate to. But like too many of us, when it comes to too many matters of health and wholeness, I just kept right on pushing through and saying, you know, it's nothing, really. I'm, I'm fine, totally fine. You ever said that about something that was going on in your life until eventually, you know, the pain becomes such a fixture that you learn to almost tune it out so that it becomes like white noise? I think a lot of us do that, but then a lot of us can attest that, that can only go on for so long. And that's the way it was with me. Once I reached that point where it couldn't go on any longer, once I became self-accepting and started seeking help, I started looking for something else too. I started looking for understanding in the stories of other people. And in particular, I began looking for stories of other trans clergy, looking for examples of what gender transition can look like when you're a minister, for examples of congregations who welcomed and affirmed trans and gender diverse people, and as it turns out, there are plenty of good stories out there. Reverend Dr. Martin uh, Megan Rohrer, a trans person who was recently elected as a bishop over a district of Lutheran churches in the States, they've told me that there are about 300 of us trans clergy here in North America, and our stories are out there to be found, but what I found when I went out looking for those stories were instances in which precious little space was afforded for personal witness. Instances where trans ministers and their congregations expeditiously agreed to part company and did it behind closed doors. Or stories where churches moved quickly to fire trans clergy and then had little to say about it other than no comment. Or stories about pastors who stepped down, quietly transitioned, and then found something else to do with their lives. Now, I'll confess, but there was something tempting about that last scenario. As it became clear to me that I was going to need to come out and transition, I longed at times to, to resign and drop off the radar for a season and just find a different vocation as my authentic self. But I understood enough about the power of personal witness that I couldn't choose that path, not in good conscience. And I didn't want to become a, an accomplice in my own marginalization. You see, I had been witnessing that marginalization and its effects for decades. Even before I became self-accepting, I'd been an ally in the struggle for LGBTQ plus inclusion 
in, in faith communities for almost the entire time I'd been a minister. I had spoken up against homophobia and transphobia in churches. I had sat on committees that were convened to address matters of LGBTQ plus inclusion. I had nervously raised the issue in board meetings and in deacons meetings. I had been part of countless conversations with parishioners over the years. I had preached sermons about how our churches need to open our doors wider and wider. I had published articles about how our churches shouldn't exclude people on the basis of their sexual orientation or, or how we ought to be safer spaces for trans and gender diverse youth. I had sat down with seminary presidents and with missions executives and denominational leaders and I had said to them, look, we've got to do better on this. I had talked about how our persistent stigmatization of queer people is is based on biblical interpretation that is responsible and it's also deadly. I had listened to other people talk about their perspectives and in recent years I had begun citing statistics about the correlation between religious faith and suicidal ideation in LGBTQ plus youth. These numbers are chilling. And they show that queer youth are far less likely to self-harm, that their lives are far safer if they stay away from the church. Now, as a minister, that breaks my heart, and it breaks my heart that so many of our churches have blood on our hands. So I'd been doing this work, the work of an ally, for almost 20 years, and, and all the time I heard people say, we're just not ready. We just can't talk about it. We can't handle the conversation, the issue is too controversial. I heard that again and again and again. Now that it's Pride Month, we would do well to remember that marginalized people don't have a history of attaining dignity and equality and inclusion and liberation because we and our allies have avoided controversy. From the Compton's cafeteria riots and the Stonewall riots in the U.S. to the bathhouse raids and the fallout here in Canada, these movements forward are never the result of civility and proper procedure and prioritizing the comfort of people who are not on the margins. I am not an issue for civil debate. I am not an abstract idea with two sides to argue. I am a person. I am flesh and blood, just like you. And it might be easy to hate an idea, to say not right now to an idea, but it's hard to do that with a person. It's hard to hate a person. We understand this as people of faith. As, as Christians, we have the audacity to confess that the ineffable, transcendent, everlasting God, the creator of all things, the being that is being itself, somehow became a person like you and like me. The, the word, the eternal voice became flesh and moved into our human neighborhood. And we confess that God has always been a revealing God, that God is always speaking, that God is always inspiring and moving among us in ways that are intended to be conspicuous, in ways that are knowable and discernible and perceivable, but as followers of Jesus, we like to confess that God's fullest and clearest revelation happens when God takes on flesh and blood, when God walks among us on a pair of human feet, when God speaks to us with a human voice, when God loves us with a beating human heart, when God reaches out to us with a set of open human arms. It's such a vulnerable gesture, friends. Because hands and feet can be pierced after all. Voices can cry out in pain and abandonment. Hearts can be broken. We know how these stories go. We tell these stories, usually around Holy Week. But we also know that nothing changes us and that nothing changes our world like personal witness. Like that little girl that told her church she believed God was calling her into ministry. Like the black woman who wouldn't give up her seat. Like the black man we watched get assaulted by police in that cell phone camera footage. Like the gay man who decided to be open and proud and run for city council. Like the queer author who resolved that she was going to write stories about women whose stories weren't being told 
And like the trans kids who just a couple of weeks ago had to go to their state capitals and stand in front of an assembly of lawmakers and plead for their freedom just to exist. Personal witness matters. Friends, people and their stories, their flesh and blood experiences, they're important, they matter. Writing more than, than 30 years ago now, um, about John chapter 1, the, the gospel passage that I read just a few moments ago, that gay Christian historian John Boswell pointed out that you can't use reason to argue someone out of position he didn't get into by reason. In other words, when an idea is just an idea, it's really hard to outgrow it, it's hard to get around it, it's easy to hate it. Boswell went on to say that there are other ways to overcome prejudice. There are other ways to discover enlightenment. A life can be an argument, he said. Being can be a reason. An idea can be embodied in a person. And in human form, it might break down barriers and soften hardness of heart that words could not. This is, he said, at least in part, what John the Evangelist meant when he referred to Christ as the word, as the logos. Although translators often render that as word, it is much more than that, he says. that it's, it's, uh, it's, In the original language, it means reason and argument, and our word for logic comes from it. So Christ was God's unanswerable argument. When God's people had hardened their hearts against spoken reasons, the arguments propounded for centuries by prophets and sages, God sent an argument in the form of a human being, a life, a person, and that argument became flesh and blood, so real, Boswell said, that no one could refute or ignore it. And Boswell would end up making a beautiful connection between the flesh and blood witness of Jesus Christ, God's everlasting word, and queer Christians. It's much harder for most people to remain hostile and unmoved by a living sibling than it is to rail against an abstraction, Boswell wrote. Queer Christians are like the word in this sense, arguments incarnated as persons who make their commitment, their lives, and their beings an unanswerable living statement of faithfulness and love. Just like it's easy to hate an idea, an abstraction, it's easy for us to run and hide sometimes, to disappear to take up less space, to not make ourselves vulnerable, to not make waves. And sometimes that's a matter of personal safety or health, and that's okay. But sometimes, folks, people like me have to stand up and be public and be vulnerable and be visible and be proud and be unashamed. Friends, let's tell our stories. Let's live our stories. Whether it's the story of a woman pastor who carried around the burden of a mistaken and misunderstood gender identity for decades and is finally publicly living her truth, or the stories of the millions of other queer people of faith who are living and serving and faithfully loving right here in our midst, right here in our churches, or the stories of those wonderful churches like yours. Where all are welcome means all are welcome. Where anybody, regardless of age or race or nationality or class or orientation or ability or gender or gender identity or gender expression or whatever, can join together in discovering and fulfilling God's great dream for this world. We are not a bunch of abstract ideas, beloved. We are people, we are flesh and blood and experience. We are witnesses, we are voices. By the grace of our creator and in the power of the everlasting word, we are lives. We are the stories through which God speaks of a transformed world. That's who I am, that's who you are, that's who we are, beloved. Thanks be to God, and happy pride. Amen.